Hi, my name is Jim Lopes. I'm the Visitor Services Supervisor at Fall River Heritage State Park, and I'm looking forward to this summer season. This summer we're celebrating Fall River again. It's called Rediscover Fall River, and we start the season off by taking Fall River back to its roots, to the original settlers in Fall River, the Pocassets. And we're, we're very fortunate to have brought together a collaboration of three different entities. There's the Pocasset tribe of Fall River, and I don't know how many of you know this, but they still live here. Uh, your neighbors and friends may be Pocassets, descendants of the original settlers of their area. And we also have Dave Jennings from the South Coast Historical Alliance, who does these wonderful dioramas of Fall River history. And he's done two dioramas for us. One of them is, well, they both represent 17th century Massachusetts communities, one Pocasset and one Pilgrim. And finally, we have uh, some artwork here by local artist Sheila Oliveira, who is doing a series of icons, uh, Fall River icons in oil. And she started with Weedemo and King Philip. So uh, join us here in, uh, in Fall River Heritage uh, on the banks of the Quickishan and the ancestral land of the uh, Pocassets. We look forward to a great summer of rediscovering Fall River. I'm Eleanor Page. I'm the tribal historian. My husband is the chief of the tribe. So on this presentation, we've got the Picasso tribe past and present. This gentleman here was Josephus Perry. And his job was at the time to go in and try to get back some of the land that was taken from us. They were going to give, which was the CC camp. And uh, the federal government was trying to close down the CC camp and uh, give it to the state of Massachusetts. So what they tried to do was go in and get the get equivalent lands that was taken from Fall River in 1907 for the uh, protection of the water supply. So what they were going to do is try to get an equivalent acreage in the Freetown State Forest so that the people could live on the land. And this was Josephus, and he petitioned the legislature to come up with a bill that would return the land to the natives that lost about 101 plus acres in Fall River. And it looked like at this time when the picture was taken that the reservation was gonna go through, that they were gonna get it. So in 1938, the legislation was passed in the uh, House and Senate of Massachusetts. And they found 12 families of the Picasset tribe that were originally there that would benefit from this land. And we show this because this is the grandson of Josephus Perry, and he was on the tribe until his passing last year. We also have today Donald Perry's son, Daniel, Daniel's daughter, Joy, and Daniel's sister, uh, Dana. So the line continued from the Perry family all the way through to today's membership. On here, we have Fall River's world famous Dr. William P.P. P. Perry. A lot of the old timers know the story of Dr. Perry, an Indian doctor who was also known for his antics of skating on the ponds. And um, he had his family on the upper portion of Indian Town Road. So his family was the ones that were awarded a house to go and live on the land and a barn and some acreage. And they were to live on there till the last one had passed. And then the land would revert back to the hold being held by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So this is Dr. Perry's great grandson and Ralph passed away also a year ago. But his two daughters, Elise and Carrie, are still on the tribe today. We continue the lineage so that the tribe does not die out. On here we have Cicerin Johnson. She was very widely known in New Bedford. Her land on the tribe was in Dartmouth. And she was known for walking around in New Bedford and smiling at everyone that greeted her. She insisted she was a descendant of those old time Pocasset people and that nobody was taking her land from her. 
So today on the tribe, we have her great-granddaughter, Diane, who lives down in Mashby, but she holds the line of the Terry family onto the tribe today. So we continue. It hasn't died out, it's still here. And with their children, hopefully it will continue on for many years. This is a description of Daniel Page descendants that the land was given to for the, for the Picasso and the, and the Page family descendants that lived on the land. This is the chief's, today's chief's great uncle, his uncle, and he worked for the Water Department of Florida, but he also fought in the, war, in the wars that followed. He's brother to Edward, which is my grandfather, which is my father's father. So Allison Miller is uh, one of our, our members. Um, she is the granddaughter of Nada, who was uh, Reverend Leroy Perry's oldest child. Um, Nada uh, was born in Fall River um, on the reservation, and her father, who was born in 1874 with his twin brother, um, their names were Frederick and Edward Crank. Um, they were later adopted by their mother's uh, husband, Commodore Perry, and that's where the name Perry comes from. And Leroy Perry became, was elected uh, first as a sub-chief of the Narragansetts, because Picasso was always under Narragansett historically, that's why the set is at the end. And uh, that was probably in 1921. And in 1925, the Wampanoags Nation met in Herring Pond, which is this side of the canal. Um, and they elected Leroy as the great sachem of the Wampanoag Nation, which included Bristol, Plymouth, and Barnstable counties, and Dukes as well. And, so he was, he was the man. He was named Osamequin. Uh, he was a minister. He also fought alongside Josephus for the return of land up in uh, what is now Freetown. Um, and they, they were awarded it, uh, but they were never, because of the 38 hurricane and the various wars that followed in the 40s and 50s, whether it was World War II or or it was uh, Korea, Vietnam, all of these you know, distractions of, of families' lives, um, it never was utilized the way it, you know, it could have been. Um, but Leroy has, has left a tremendous legacy for each of, each of the bands of, of the Wampanoag's family, of uh, both the Quina, uh, who first got their federal recognition, um, as well as Mashpee and Herring Pond and the Picassets. Um, we're still here, and uh, we still work together and, and want hope for the future generations to become better stewards um, of this land and, and to keep preserving it as best we can. Hi, my name is Donna Rain Dance Page. I'm with the Picasso Wampanoag tribe, who was the true lineal descendants in Four River, Native Americans of the area of Four River. And we're at the museum today for we can show you our lineal descending in our line and how we've been here since the contact period and how we're still a tribe, still in existence today, still on our sacred, still on our sacred land and doing the rights for our tribe of people and our, lin our lineal descendants. This is the tribe today, some of the members of the tribe. The chief is my father, Edward Gray Fox Page. The tribe consists of over 250 people as of today. This is our tribal council. The council is made up of the different people that are the lineal descendants that tie themselves to the land in the Picasset tribe. They are the ones that take the votes and the minutes and speak and get the message out there or whatever direction we're going in on our plate with our tribal lands, okay? So everything goes through the format of the council. We have an elders council. The elders are the overseers of everything that gets put because they're the history. They're the true history of the tribe. 
I'm, I do the women's medicine and medicine work and go to different events, different ceremonies, and do the different ceremonies on, on our lands or on the waters or at powwows or when we're meeting with other tribes. No, we are still here today. We're still existing today. And we're still on our tribal, we're on our tribal lands and we're not leaving. <laughs> we are the true tribe of the four of the area and we've been here for a long time and we're still standing. This is the Pocasset tribal land. This is what is on the section that is left, the 96 acres and stuff is here. We have a meeting house, we have a circle for ceremonies. Uh, we tend to stay up there, the chief loves it, he's always up there, he's fiddling with something, fixing the meeting house or fixing this, but that's um, the center of the lands that's there still. Uh, we do clean up, we have land cleanups, which includes the burial ground. This is the monument to Daniel Page from the Daughters of the American Revolution for his work uh, capturing Colonel Prescott down in Portsmouth. And this is the altar, the actual pictures of the altar. And there's some shells that are here and some, um, some mementos from some of the other families who's, who's, they go down there and they think about their ancestors and their nieces and nephews that were on the tribe previous. And it's a quiet spot down here that they can take a walk to and actually sit for a while and think about the land, the people who lived there. It's very close to the Watapa Pond, just down the path a little way. But that's the burial grounds. Things that the tribe does. We go to schools in Fall River and we teach about the history of the Picasset people that were here. We ha also had powwows at the Boys and Girls Club because our powwows are always honor our children. So this is our elder and her daughter who are telling stories about native life in the past. We dance at the powwow. Here are two of our friends, the chief's very good friends, who are doing dancing in the circle at the powwow. And over here was our um, lead male dancer and a friend of the tribe. She is a native, not of this area, but uh, she's Cherokee descendant. And she's um, usually at our powwows or anything the tribe has. She's quite a friend of ours. This is a very interesting one. This is on the Mount Hope Bridge over in Bristol to uh, Portsmouth. This was taken in 1929. This was the opening of the bridge. And here you have members of the Narragansett and Pocasset tribes with the Reverend Leroy Perry here, and they were opening it. It spanned uh, the lands of both of those tribes. This here is um, the committee during the colonial times that researched the land here to make sure that it was of the same uh, acreage as the land they were given in Tiverton. It was both Benjamin Church lands that the colony gave to the natives, but they had to make sure that it was researched and done. So here, the um, committee appointed by the colony at the request of the Picasset Indians to look at the lands and switch it over for their benefit. And it was, it was just about the same. And so the land in Tiverton was switched over to Freetown in 1707. And that's where the community ended up there. And this is part of the lands that's still there today. In 1907, when the city's water department decided to, to take and condemn the, the Indian reservation up at Indian Town Road and Blossom Road, um, there was a book that was published by a gentleman that actually was one of the owners of the mills that was profiting off of the water. Um, but this was in the pictures and it says one building of the Fall River Indian Reservation 
1907. And uh, a few years ago, um, while doing nothing better than exploring, uh, there, there is an old outhouse uh, on the property. It's a three-seater because there were three young children that once resided there. And uh, so that was funny enough, but uh, having, having you know, know, known enough about old outhouses in this area, I closed the door to see what was on the back. And there was this painting by Violet Perry. And what I realized was that the wall and our barns are the same. And Violet Perry uh, not only was one of the last of the, the Perry family to live on the reservation, she also was a very well-known calligrapher for the state of Massachusetts and Boston. And she would take the train there to do, I guess, proclamations and such uh, during her lifetime. And she was also an artist, and I didn't know that until I checked out her outhouse. <laughs> this, this is an ancient uh, a painting of about 100 years old. It's of Tiwilima who was Melinda Gould, um, who lived in Lakeville. And her mother, Zavaya, is, is well known because she authored a book on the history of Massasoit with um, a Pierce, but I can't think of it, Ebenezer Pierce, uh, in Freetown. Um, and they, they attended, you can see her baskets in the Plymouth Museum, the, uh, the Pilgrim Museum. You can also see the damn musket that uh, killed Philip, but we won't tell, talk about that. Um, that's also on display there. But this is, so this is an old uh, painting of Tiwilima. There's many postcards that are similar. Um, and there's, there's quite a few photographs uh, because the missionaries were always trying to convert them. So there's a lot of photographs from the late 1800s um, until their passing. This, is, this younger picture is of Kathitha. Uh, Kathitha is Hazel Perry. She was the youngest daughter of the Reverend Leroy Perry. And Kathitha means center of the heart is sweetest. And she lived in both, she was born uh, in Providence. Her siblings, Nada and Earl, were born in Fall River. And uh, she was born in Providence, uh, which is where a number of the, the residents from the reservation after they were burned out or kicked out of the reservation or had left for, for other jobs, um, they did go to Providence for employment. And uh, Kathitha was very loyal to her Wampanoag roots and to her father, and has left us a treasure trove of, of history for our future generations to, to study and to, to learn from. And then I, I refer to that other painting as the first Treaty of Lies, um, where you've got all the pilgrims just lying. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing. They broke every, every promise they ever made. And Corbin was present uh, with Massasoit at that treaty signing, um, but it was the first of many broken promises. And this is a, a picture that I've always thought was Huidamo. Uh, Huidamo is always is one of our most honored females um, of the Picasset uh, memory. When the pilgrims first had, had met with Massasoit and they promised them the sun and the moon, one of his right-hand uh, chiefs was uh, Corbinet Todison from the Rochester area, Tyas from Akushinea, which is the New Bedford area, and uh, he had two daughters. Corbinet was of Fall River. Huidamo is renowned because she fought against the English. Corbinet was very resistant to believing. He, he didn't want to, he, he couldn't trust the people that were coming here and promising the sun and the moon uh, to the natives in exchange for, for land because the, the value of land was not considered a timeline. It was just everybody should be a good steward for where you live. Uh, Huidamo uh, was born in Fall River. Um, she has a sister named Wootenusky, and uh, who, according to the Reverend Leroy Perry, Huidamo means the keeper of the fire in the lodge, and she really looked out for her people after her father's passing. Uh, she only lived about 35 years, and, and yet had several husbands, about five different husbands, but she was also marrying, when she would marry, as did her sister Wootenusky that was married to Philip, um, they, they, they were hoping to strengthen their, their bonds with other tribes. So many people know of Huidamo, and it's because she fought alongside King Philip 
during King Philip's War, when they had realized that they were being betrayed, that their land was being taken, and they were no longer being respected, so that they could no longer farm their historic lands, they could no longer have their, their ceremonies. They were being Christianized by, by Eliot's crew and, and Gukin's crew, uh, the Reverend Gukin, and it, they were in trouble and they knew that they had to fight against them. Quidamo, although, like I said, she, she didn't see 40, she commanded all of the, the Picasset people and she worked closely also with Narragansett and, and she and Philip were, you know, instrumental um, in, in preserving the few of us that remained. She drowned uh, after being chased by uh, Benjamin Church after he had killed uh, Philip at, uh, in Bristol at the, the Myrie Swamp. And when she was trying to get away, she, she got onto a raft or a canoe that could not handle the waves in the Taunton River and she drowned. And worse yet, both she and Phillips uh, were, were not only dismembered, their heads were placed on stakes and they were brought to uh, what was then the head of uh, Plymouth Colony, which was Taunton. And they were, they were put on stakes for about 20 years. Um, according to many myths, uh, Philip's head was removed by the Leonard family that felt very committed to him, and his head was placed under their doorstep, which is now under a highway ramp. So, I don't know. There's lots of stories. And again, other people wrote our history for us. So it depends on what year the books are written, who was writing it, for what, for what purpose. Uh, when you read the, the book that we started with about the Indian Reservation, um, on the Watupa, their excuse for taking our land, uh, they dismiss us, we've gone away, you know, uh, we're just, you know, instead of we're just trying to survive in a, in a world where all of a sudden you're working in, in, in factories and not in, in the outdoors with the, with the farms um, that we normally would go to. There are also, um, there's just a, a few lists. There's Roger Williams also. He'd been ostracized in Massachusetts because of his beliefs. And so he went to Narragansett and again promised the sun and the moon and did not deliver. Um, but, you know, we have the, the Page family has continued to stay here. Um, though, you know, many have moved and, and have lived all over. They have, you know, been documented throughout the history of Fall River. Every book that has, you know, has anything about Fall River uh, will always mention somebody of the Page family um, because they've always been here. Um, and when you go to many different communities in our area, you'll always hear about the last Wampanoag, the last Narragansett, the last Indian, and it's, ju it's just a bunch of BS. There's no other description. Um, and uh, so I'm always very grateful and honored by uh, the leadership and the dedication that their family has had to being true stewards for the land. Um, the bioreserve encompasses most of the North Wetupa. Um, Green Futures has always been a fabulous advocate uh, for its stewardship, um, but there's a lot of things that go on that never should have uh, happened there, including our limited access to our burial grounds where we need to ask for keys and and need to show IDs when we go there. Um, but we're still here. Um, in this display, we have numerous baskets that were made locally with uh, some baskets were seagrass um, with ash twine around them. Um, they were actually used for scooping uh, water, I would guess. Uh, we have a potato stamp, which was one of the ways that we marked our uh, baskets um, for identification, whether they were ours or if we were gifting them to someone. Um, the Watupa means a place of many canoes, um, and so we've always had lots of collections of various little bark canoes. Um, you can find them pretty much all over uh, Turtle Island, and this one particularly has some uh, porcupine quills on it. Um, there's also a little uh, bottle that has got a basket around it, um, probably for just, that was made locally. Um, I picked it up at a yard sale and a cushion it. 
and uh, but the the seagrass and uh, one of the wooden uh, scoops that's in here came from the Westport and Fall River Blossom Blossom Road area. Um, the seed basket uh, is also uh, from Fall River. That's made with um, seeds from the cedar. White cedar is extremely sacred to us. It's always been part of our ceremonies. Um, and so when I, when I saw that originally, um, I, was, I was very taken with it. I've been collecting baskets locally my whole life um, because I, I knew what to look for, I guess. So I just was always very keen on it. And then there's some other porcupine uh, baskets. But turkey feathers um, are, are what we always <laughs> are, are gifted when we walk in the forest. And um, we always offer shells from the beaches that our ancestors would go to, because we didn't just live in, on the Wetapa. Um, you know, that was a ceremonial stone area, a uh, place of ancient uh, history of the tribe, tribal people that were here. And, and so everybody always wants to kind of put you in a shoebox, but um, we, would, we would stay there at certain times of the year. We would travel to plant at other times. Um, so we're, we're visiting throughout Bristol and Plymouth County during our, our calendar year, because we've been here for thousands of years. When you think about um, Peace Haven, uh, Al Lima had, had done a tremendous amount of research, as did many archeologists over the years. Uh, at one point when Meditech had proposed to build there, there, were, there was a tremendous amount of archeology span done. But in the 1930s and 40s, it was uh, everybody's favorite weekend holiday was to bring your family out for a picnic and go dig up some Indian graves. And so our displays, uh, the Somerset Historic Society has a, a, a museum and an old school and one classroom is filled with the funerary objects of the Picasso people from Peace Haven. Um, beautifully designed arrows in every possible you know, manner um, and many different stone tools, but they came from Peace Haven. Um, even with all of the research that was done by, and documentations by various archaeologists, um, a few years ago, a gentleman who had been trying to develop that area, um, which already did have Algonquin gas going through it because of the trains um, that came from Taunton into Fall River, um, he had been trying to develop it. He promised that he was going to do some condos here and a fast food restaurant there, and we'd have a couple of stores here and there. And once he got all the permits lined up, and I attended many of those hearings because um, we were concerned about the areas that we knew were sacred to the Picasso people, um, and they had, they had cut that off. Meditech had also cut it off. They, had, they said they were going to donate 350 acres and, to preserve it. Uh, closest to the Taunton River, um, and and this gentleman, it, when he's I don't even know what happened, uh, it, but as soon as he got all the permits in order, um, it was sold to an auto auction group, which ended up uh, uh, Paved Paradise put up a parking lot, and so there's a parking lot for 22,000 cars on an area that had been documented at being 12,000 years of occupation. So when people say, oh, you don't belong here, you know, you, you know my children and, and grandchildren kind of snicker. And uh, I know the Page family has always felt that uh, dilemma with it. But we've, you know, I mean, the Braga Bridge goes over our Quickishan River. Um, it's mostly, it, the Quickishan was the, the leaping and falling river. It fell 137 feet to the, the Taunton River here and yet it's under cul culverts. The, many of the men that owned the water department back in the day, uh, they were the, the mill keepers that had, were using the water for their power of their mills. And uh, so most of the Quickishan River is underneath um, culverts and city streets to this day. And yet we know historically that uh, it fell 130 seven feet, it cast rainbows in every direction that could be seen from both Bristol and, and certain parts of Somerset and definitely from Peace Haven. Um, and, you know, we don't, there, you guys haven't been very good stewards of our stuff, so <laughs> I guess that's, that's one of our, our lessons that we've, we've learned the hard way. Um, 
but you know there's still a, a chance to to preserve stuff you know because you know the world did not begin in 1620 with Thanksgiving it did not begin in 1776 with the bicentennial um, it began long long time ago and there's still history here and uh, with the Page family always being the roots of the stewardship um, of the Picasso people in Fall River um, you know the branches may have have you know grown out all around the globe but they have always remained and so that's one of the the honors about historical tribes and it's a state recognized tribe for a reason and it's because it has the not just historic contact they've always been here and uh, they still have much to give and many lessons to give present you oh with something for the Picasso from the Picasso tribe oh my <laughs> I want to thank you for your your paintings in the honor of uh, women. You're most welcome. We the more. Yeah. In our endeavor and your display. Thank you. I honor you. Thank you. I want to give this offering to you. Oh. And this is from our medicine brooks in the lands of our waters down by the Watupa in the area where the reservation is that we're trying to hold today. Oh. And this is considered like people would think like holy water. It's very sacred, it's our land. And we honor that you're on our earth and our land. Thank you so much. I so appreciate that. And I'm gonna hand it to my husband to hold <laughs> and he'll treasure it as well. Got it? Well, that was wonderful. It made me cry a little bit. Anyway, um, I'll introduce myself. My name is Sheila Oliveira. I'm an artist and um, my I guess beginning of being interested in uh, history began about a year and a half ago, believe it or not, in terms of historical portraiture. Um, because I, I had a commission to do uh, some pieces in New Bedford. And uh, I got very interested in the idea of connecting um, people who hadn't been photographed uh, with their stories and, and specifically under uh, undertold stories, people that we haven't really studied. And of course, that led me to um, an introduction to uh, Jim Lopes. And uh, also, I want to thank, while I'm thinking about it, the um, Fall River Cultural Council for allowing me a grant to, to you know, proceed with these uh, portraits, these historical portraits. So when I spoke with Jim, I don't know, maybe a year ago, he gave me a, a list of people he would like me to explore. And one of them, of course, was Wiedemo. And he didn't give me Metacomet, but I was uh, propelled to do that, and I have no real idea why, except that when I started to learn more about Wiedemo, I'm going to get out of the way, um, I learned about <laughs> the two of them as a, a team, almost, in history, and how they worked so hard to protect uh, the land that belonged to them and the struggles that they had um, to do that. They were very connected in that way. Uh, so my process and my interest is really kind of learning about the struggles the life journey, as uh, we heard about earlier today, the four stages, if you will, of a life journey. And these people certainly had a, quite, a, quite a life journey. Uh, when you have a group of colonists that come to your land, and I don't want to use the word intrude, but I guess that would be the proper term, uh, take over what is rightfully yours, and proceed to develop, steal, um, put you down, kind of put you in categories. Um, you try to negotiate your way with that. You try to get along, um, but sometimes it doesn't work out. And that's why we had the King Philip War. Uh, so who's Wiedemo? I didn't know much about her. Um, but I had seen, uh, you know, of course, different variations. I, I did Google search it on the, um, on the internet, 
and she was uh, from a time when photography did not exist. I'm going to pass this so you can see my visual references. There were no real photographs to, um, you know, kind of draw upon. All I had really was reference from reading and from learning about that particular time in, in history. What I did learn about Wiedemo was that she was indeed uh, a queen. She was a sachem. Uh, she was regal. She was beautiful. Um, she was a strong leader. Her people loved her. And, you know, I grew up in Fall River, so I knew where Wiedemo Street was. I went to Camp Tatapanam as a kid. That's another name for uh, Wiedemo. She was called uh, Tatapanam, which I discovered. She had several names. I went to those places, I walked those streets, and I didn't have a clue who I was dealing with. So all of a sudden, she came to life for me. From my past as a Girl Scout, <laughs> living in, uh, you know, Camp Tatapan, I'm in tents, and, uh, you know, from the land, uh, enjoying that beautiful natural setting. And she really became real to me. So I started to uh, sketch and design who I thought she could be. What I learned about her uh, was that tragically she lost her life um, at the end of the, or toward the end of the King Philip War in a very tragic way. She drowned in its waters right here and uh, her body was desecrated. Um, but I didn't want to portray her like that. I wanted to kind of shift back to the time when she was a real queen and when she was uh, proud and beautiful and strong. And so I knew she didn't look like a European, <laughs> you know. And, and the, uh, if you look at the paper I'm passing around, you can see that in some uh, illustrations, she's, uh, you know, she looks European. And I, I didn't want to do that, you know. I wanted her to be real to me, who I, I thought she would be. Uh, she was a dancer, she was a uh, bead maker, um, spiritual leader. She had all kinds of um, love of the people that she uh, was living with. They really adored her for who she was. She did, was influenced by uh, the European uh, Puritans, Puritans, colonists. Um, she wore makeup, she powdered her hair. She did, she wore a lot of jewelry. Um, so she did do things like that. I think in terms of how we all uh, assimilate into cultures. You know, we don't live in a, a vacuum. We all kind of meld into something other than what we once were. So that's um, Wiedemo's story as far as how I was able to bring her to life for me. Any questions? No? Okay. Uh, it's in oil. I just, yeah, go ahead. Say that again. Yeah, um, well, I would assume, and I'm not sure, but, um, you know, a lot of this was, you know, how can I say it? As an artist, it's always interpretive, okay? So a lot of it, it isn't like a photograph or a factual record. You try, and I'm looking around me, and I see that you are wearing beads and feathers, and so I knew that that was part of the culture. I also assumed that, um, you know, she was having not, you know, some kind of a wrap. Whether it was an animal skin, I assumed it was, so I kind of made it look like that. I gave her um, a fur skin to wear around her neck. I, I put jewelry uh, on her because I knew that she wore that. What is that? She was a queen and she dressed the part. Thank you. Yeah, that's a terrific word. She was a queen and she dressed the part. And... Um, I put her on the shore of the river, and I did that. Um, I have her holding a staff and, uh, you know, kind of looking uh, regal, yeah. So, you know, basically, uh, to explain every little thing, it was my honest interpretation, and I just kind of went with it. I knew that, uh, you know, uh, designs and things of that nature are really 
meaningful, but not being a historian and having very little time to actually research what all those things, and maybe the Picasso tribe can answer some of those uh, questions about what those you know, different motifs are, because I really don't know. But I, I just kind of went with it. So we'll move on to Metacomma. And I think it's important to look at that sheet uh, because the um, <coughs> references about Metacomet were, first of all, there wasn't as much to learn about him personally. Um, I, I don't know, I guess it wasn't a situation where there was a close um, person who wrote it, as opposed to uh, Wiedemo. There was one of her ca uh, the captors, if you will, and the name is, Dave, can you help me with that? Mary, Mary Rollins, uh, Roland. Roland. Uh, she wrote a, a, an important historical account of her time being Wiedemo's, um, I don't know, captive, captive. <laughs> yeah. And I think it's still um, pretty well read and pretty well uh, referenced today. So we have a real account of her. I couldn't find anything on Metacomet. What I did find, um, and if you can see, you know, for an artist to go back and try to create what a person looks like without any uh, real references. So you can see here uh, that he has a significantly high forehead as pictured. Um, if you look uh, carefully in two of these illustrations, he's got kind of a, a prominent nose and a little bit crooked. Uh, he's also wearing a crown in some. I didn't want to do that. Uh, so I had him more in a, a, his natural state, so I felt. Um, I also found that he's pictured with this star on several of the illustrations. And I don't know uh, what that is exactly. I don't know if you can help me. Anyone? No. But he is pictured with that, so it led me to believe that that was a true representation. Um, so let's get back to how I felt about him. I think he was, first of all, they were related, brother and sister-in-law, <laughs> which I found kind of humorous in a way. Everyone see this? Yeah, we're good, okay, I'll put it here. It's a good reference. Oh, and I do want to say that um, there is a WPA mural in the Durfee Tech Building. Are, are you familiar with what I'm speaking? Uh, John Mann, who um, painted uh, a full narrative of Fall River uh, in the Durfee Tech Building. Is it still there, Dave? Yeah. Um, this is uh, taken, I got this from the library, and here is pictured um, Wiedemo as she's found um, by, I guess, her tribe members and others. It's not very flattering, and I didn't want to, I didn't want to go there. So, so getting back to Metacomet. Well, I don't know how many of you have been stuck on Metacomet Avenue in Rhode Island. Anybody? Like for a, you know, good half hour, maybe. <laughs> so, you know, that name was very familiar to me and a little aggravating, because I've gotten stuck in that traffic many times. Also, uh, you know, interestingly, they have the best corn on Metacomet Avenue. Uh, you have sweet corn? I lived in Tewissett for a short period of time. I, knew, I now know that means land of the corn. So that whole area and our two uh, portraits here, these people really represented a love of the land. And so you can imagine how they felt when it was challenged. Uh, what was happening and what really caused the King Philip War was a series of unfortunate events leading to the stealing uh, land from uh, the natives who lived here. Um, they would make uh, contractual agreements which were negated or somehow uh, wasn't good enough for the colonists. So anyway, getting back to him, I decided that I was going to probably give him a somber look give him a uh, take no prisoners kind of look. <laughs> and uh, 
you know, so I was um, kind of pulled in that direction, you know, to make him look uh, like he meant business. And I, the um, illustrations I saw really weren't very flattering at all to him, so I wanted to kind of raise that level a little bit and give him the honor to which I believe he deserved and does deserve. So that's really, um, you know, where I come in. I, I did do the, um, the background in kind of a, uh, a dramatic fashion. I looked to put feathers in his hair because I felt that that would be something appropriate that he would do. He did wear jewelry. They did put, you know, that was something that was common. Um, and so that's really, you know, without having much real information on him, either written, there was not much. I did learn a tremendous amount about the struggles of our, um, our first peoples here. You know, it was tremendous to learn about that and how Massasoit, who was really the first uh, Native American to greet the settlers and help them, and only one generation later, the whole thing fell apart. Just went totally south, you know, because of land, assets, greed, mistrust, misunderstanding, who knows, but here they are, and I hope that I have represented them uh, into the um, glory that I... I don't know. I just saw, uh, Jim, that when I looked at all the illustrations of, of Metacomet, um, you know, there were some features that really rang out, and uh, he's got that star on in three of these illustrations. So I don't, you know, personally know what the star means, but apparently he wore it, you know, if it's in three of the illustrations. learn along the way that he was this, the head of his people and star of his people and trying to lead them in, in a direction with the colonists that came over after all those wars, but unfortunately it turned the opposite way. Yeah, that is a, a terrific point and thank you. So what she is saying is that he was the star, the leading star of the people. And I love that because I don't know. It's true. Anyway, um, they're both, oh, yeah. You have to start. The fabulous start. What other paintings are you doing? What other people have you identified? Who's next? Who's next? Oh, okay. Um, as I mentioned, I've got a, a grant to do historical uh, personages, and um, I'm, I'm really enjoying it. I, you know, I just do. I like to kind of recreate these people. So we now have coming, is it next month? Um, our composer from Fall River, uh, Joe Raposo. Have we heard of Joe Raposo? Yes. I'll sing for you, but I don't want to clear the room. Uh, but he did um, all the Sesame Street songs. So, uh, and he worked closely with Jim Henson, who did the Muppets. So it was uh, Joe Raposo who is a Fall River, was a Fall River native. He only died at 51 years of age. And you know, I, I couldn't help but think you to talk about the journey of life and how in only 51 years, this man has created a legacy that will far live as they did. And I think that's the... Yeah, I think that's what's intriguing to me uh, as, a, as an artist is to um, kind of support that. But anyway, my next one is going to be a full piece of all our Muppet friends and a portrait of um, Joe Raposo, who's going to be in, in with the Muppets. And it's a big painting, very large painting, on canvas. And hopefully you know where to put it, right? <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. So we've got him, and, and then I am going to do, um, this building is named for uh, Hudner. Okay, well, I don't know if you've ever been to the Hudner Oncology, anybody? Or been to any of these Hudner? 
Yeah, okay. So, Hudner, Hudner, Hudner. As a kid and as a woman, I've been to all these places, and now I really know who this man is, and I am going to present a, uh, a portrait of him as well that uh, Mr. Lopes is very kind enough to be supportive of my work and uh, exhibit it here. So with that, I'm going to close in... Um, who else am I doing? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Should we talk about that now? <laughs> okay, so uh, another person I've already done and will be on exhibit here is um, Sarah Anna Lewis. Now, who's Sarah Anna Lewis? Sarah Anna Lewis was a young woman who, in Fall River, was the first woman, black woman, to graduate from Bridgewater State College and teach in the public school system here. And um, so I did a portrait of her. There was a lot of visual reference for her, so I didn't have to work too hard to conjure her up. And I, it really is like that. You know, you really have to kind of conjure them up. Um, but I had a lot of visual uh, information on her. Um, so I've got a very, very nice portrait, and I'm very fond of it, of, of her. Interestingly enough, and as we fight uh, some of these uh, civil rights issues today, uh, for land ownership and rights uh, that are, are taken for granted, this young woman, when she decided that she was going to marry after she got her graduate degree from Bridgewater, which they called the normal school in those days. I don't know why, but they did. Uh, so she got her, her degree to teach, and she fell in love and decided to get married. Well, guess what? The law then said that she could not teach because she was married. So I did a nice portrait of her. Who else did I do? Oh, yes. And I did one other um, that I thought was really important. And, and uh, as I say, Jim gave me kind of a, a wish list. And this woman is Eliz Elizabeth Buffum Chase. And she's just this lady uh, who was a Quaker. And the Quakers really were very interested in uh, human rights. They were humanists and very much abolitionists. And she. Uh, had much tragedy in her life. She lost, I think, five children of her own. But she went on to um, begin to work uh, in the Underground Railroad. So in Fall River, uh, she was very much a civil rights activist. And I did a, a nice portrait of her. So I hope that in the future you'll come and visit and see some of these other portraits that will be on view. Yeah. No. Basically, either one. So, like, it was probably more of like a intuitive, I guess, maybe experience. Like, what was your process? Were you like sketching and saying, "Well, this is not me tomorrow," and then you would like kind of. Go that's back exactly to the what happens. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what happens. I, I hate to sound, uh, I don't know, too much like an artist, but they speak to you. Yeah. <laughs> they do. They really. They kind of tell you when they're done. They tell you when you've gone. Uh, in the wrong direction, or you kind of feel it intuitively, and I do start with sketches, and um, sometimes you have to let them rest. Yeah. So, like with her, I had to let her rest, and then I went on to him, and then it kind of went back and forth. So that's how I work, you know. And um, in my former life, uh, you know, I taught photography for many, many years at UMass Dart Dartmouth, and I have a, a a degree in photography, right? Yeah. MFA in photography. And I became very interested in people as a result of that. And, you know, kind of working. So it wasn't new to me to uh, take a person and try to um, kind of put them in a, a certain kind of light. And that's the only way I can express it. And thank you for that question. Thank you. Okay. I think I'm all set. Can I turn this over to you now? <laughs> There's so many people that I have to honor. And as I did a ceremony outside in the opening, 
my circle and my blessing in my life is the history I was born into my father and carrying his passage, his descendancy through where we stand before the contact period. I also would like to pay a lot of respect and honor to our tribal historian, Ellie. Yay. For without her, we wouldn't even have gotten this far with her knowledge of the history and her love for and support for the chief and us local Indians. She's taught it in schools for many years and has helped us a great deal, and I thank her for that. Thank you for honoring us, Ellie. We honor you. I, I try to, I'm honoring my father and my history to keep this full circle and to pass it on through all the people that are in our tribe and our, our page history, us local Indians being here and for so long, his history. That's my job. He's the elder. Someday I will be the elder. I will have to teach right back to the children again, and let it keep coming full circle. I was honored to be blessed and gifted to this family. And I just want people to know we are who we are. We can prove who we are. We're still here and we're not going anywhere. We're gonna stand ground. I honor an 84-year-old man who has lost many a siblings, many a family, that stands on the land of what hasn't been encroached on or stolen from us to stand ground, not only for his family and his history and his descendancy, but also for the tribe and his rite of passage. And I don't want that taken away from him. And I'm gonna end on that. Oh. I teach Fall River history in an after school program for the 21st century. And in order to teach Fall River history, you have to start with the Picasso tribe. These are the people that owned the land that were here pre-colonial times. So I put together um, my image, like uh, Sheila said, in her mind what a Picasso village would look like. And uh, I can't tell you how many hours that I tried putting this thing together. I did a lot of research on it. Um, from journals <clears throat> from the colonists, the early colonists, the pilgrims, and uh, the Puritans. But um, I don't know if Sheila ends up with this, but when you look at, I was looking at uh, a blank piece of styrofoam for a couple of hours a day <laughs> for several days. And I think that's what most artists, I'm not an artist, though I don't think with that part of my brain. I was a district fire chief, I'm an ex-marine, so I'm not, I'm not saying that I am an artist. Uh, but um, I tried to pay tribute and honor to the people uh, that were first here, okay, the people of the dawn, all right, the people of the first light, correct? And you can see um, I brought some things that uh, they grew. I grew these gourds and made some ladles out of them, uh, baskets. I have... Um, <clears throat> the first, this, this is Plymouth Plantation in 1627. And when I bring this into the schools, uh, the kids really get involved with the furs and with the uh, native, uh, the uh, Picasset um, artifacts. Uh, these are all stone and wood and bone. Uh, there was no metal, the uh, Picassets didn't have metal. They lived here for 10,000 years, and they lived perfectly with the land. Um, this is how they survived. And it wasn't until Europeans came over and kind of disrupted everything with their diseases and with their wars and with their greed that the people got pushed off the land. Uh, Metacom, or King Philip, uh, one of his, his, he used to give speeches that the colonists actually wrote down. And just before the war, when things were getting really uh, 
tenuous about a war, he said he would fight no, <clears throat> he would fight till he had no more country. And he did. He died fighting for his people. And uh, as treacherous and as, uh, as, as the colonists were, um, they, he, he got the name King Philip because of, he came into Boston to sign a treaty one day and he was dressed like a king, which he was. And that's how he got the name King Philip, if I'm correct. Please, if I'm wrong, if I say anything out of character, please let me know. But I, I, I've done some research and this is, this is what I, was, I, I have read. You know, so I put that into a demonstration of uh, Native American artifacts or indigenous people artifacts. Uh, we have deer skins, beaver, wolf, otter, and uh, wampum, which is made out of cohawk shells. And the makers of that, the artists that made these uh, sh uh, beads and uh, wampum belts were uh, the women. And with stone tools, they made these beautiful belts made out of cohawk shells. And when the um, when the Poconoc and, and Pocasset surrendered, when Wamsutta surrendered, not Wamsutta, um, help me out here. Who was, who was King Philip's lieutenant? No, it was uh, Anawan. Anna. When Anawan surrendered uh, over in Rehoboth, he had the history of the people in a belt that was made out of a, cohort, a, a wampum. And it was supposed to go to back to England, and it disappeared. Nobody knows who has it anymore. So again, and then Anna Wan was given by Benjamin Church, he was given Benjamin Church's word that nothing would happen to him or his people uh, if he turned himself in, which he did, and right away they executed him. And he stuck his head outside of Plymouth. And that was a way of teaching people not to mess with them, I and mean, that was a European way of showing that he was a traitor to the English, not to his own people. And so this is what uh, I start my program with, is bringing these artifacts in uh, and telling the st story of the, uh, I know Cora, telling the story of the uh, Pocasset people. Well, I'm Eleanor Page and I'm the historian for the Picasso Wampanoag tribe. About 24 years ago, I proved my mother right. She named me Eleanor after Eleanor Roosevelt because she said I was gonna grow up and I was definitely going to stop problems from happening again, all of this stuff going on in the world. And at that point, 25 years ago, I sat down one day, my husband's the chief, and I had the most, I thought, hot felt question to ask him. And that was, why don't you have your land today? That started it, worst thing I ever asked. And he told me about his father and um, their trials of trying to get the land back which was uh, an outline of what happened. Well, outlines don't work for somebody who loves history. So that started me on my journey of libraries, historical societies, uh, archives, talking to people who knew about the natives of the time. And it just got bigger and bigger and bigger. And now I don't know whether the house we're in is a house or we're just living in a library. It's numerous books, papers, filing cabinets, that's it. But I found at the point that he was absolutely correct. The land was theirs. In 1709, land was given to the Pocasset, who fought for the colony in all of the early wars some lands at the North Watapa Pond here. And it's deeded. It's called the Benjamin Church Deed. Anyone can look it up. In that deed, he definitely 
puts out the exact conditions that these people must live on and in. And sure enough, in 1763, there is a repartition that puts all the names, the earliest people and the people in 1763. They were on it. He was on it. His family was on it. Other people we knew, their families were on it. In the bottom of the church deeds, it says, this land must be held for them forever. Not until somebody says, oh, you're just like everyone else. We're going to take it. Oh, you don't really have the right to be here. We're going to take it. In 1709, the city of them Fall River decided to tell, in 1907, decided to tell the people, we have jobs for you. We'll take you off here and we'll put you in the middle of Fall River and you will live much better. You'll have jobs. Your life will be better. Sure enough, they moved off. Most of them went to Fall River. Some of them moved to New Bedford. But the majority looked for a better life. They were promised that. The same thing Benjamin Church promised to these natives' families years ago. That wasn't so. All they did was take the land. Everything, year after year after year, gets taken from the people who were there forever. It's not right. Just because you can does not mean you should take the lands. These people are still fighting today. His father fought, his grandfather fought, his uncle fought and lost his life for this fight. We will not give up. We are not going anywhere. We have put housing on that land, not to enjoy with a picnic, but to prevent people to come on and take it from them. They are not going to allow one more blade of grass to be taken at all. It's done. It's theirs. It's their family's history. So here I am today, still speaking to you about history, still keeping up the Picasso fight. Many days I go, I've had enough. That's it. No more. I've had, the, you know, at 74 years of age, that seems to be enough. But I can't stop. I can't let my husband not do this with someone who has the ability to look up the facts. So I'll continue. You'll probably see me here again. You'll probably see me somewhere else arguing the fight. But I honor these natives, my family. They're part of me, and I'll do my best to make it better for the younger folk who are here, my niece, so that they can stand up and say, we fought for this land, and now we're going to do better for it. Thanks. <laughs>